Hello everyone, my name is Deanna and this is the Haxton Knits channel. I'm so glad you're here with me today. I am an American living in Okinawa, Japan, and if it's your first time here with me today, hello, I'm so glad you're here. Um, I do want to apologize right away for the sound today. I have all my windows open, all the doors open, it's just a really pretty day. And you will get some nice sounds like the birds chirping in the trees, but I do live in an urban Japanese neighborhood. And so you're also gonna hear probably some cars going by and some of the Japanese school children uh, playing in the street below me, the clitter clatter of bicycles going over the cement gu uh, gutters and grates and things like that. Hopefully you don't mind the noise because frankly, it's too pretty of a day to have the house all shut up and stuffed up and the air conditioner running. So this is where we are today. A little bit of noise. I'm doing the best I can to minimize that. But what do I have for you in store this episode? I don't even remember which episode this is. <laughs> But we are continuing our series on traditional knitting, and I am continuing to work on my Orenburg lace shawl pattern, so let's get started. So I started this series of talking about traditional knitted items from around the world when I cast on for this lovely, this is the Orenberg lace, the Orenberg warm shawl. And I talk about this extensively uh, about two episodes ago, if you wanna go back and talk and hear about that. Uh, but I told myself while I continued to work on this pattern that I would continue to talk about traditional knitting techniques from around the world. But admittedly this week, <laughs> I did not make very much progress on this bad boy. Um, and as a result, I also did not do a ton of research like I did last week. And so this week will be just a little bit more of a brief overview. Um, and we'll dig more into the deeper things as I get back to this pattern. The reason that this pattern didn't get much love is because what's living in this bag got all the love. And you will see more about that a little bit later in this episode. So when I think about Norwegian sweaters, that's what we're talking about this week, right? Um, I think back to my earliest uh, interaction with something that you would call a Norwegian sweater. And that came when I was living in North Dakota. And in North Dakota, I know I've talked about this in the past, there exists a yearly festival at the North Dakota State Fairgrounds called the Norsk Hustfest. And this is a festival of all things Norway. They have all the food, you know, the meatballs and the lutefisk and all the goodies and they have all the crafts so there's always knitters and spinners um, this is actually where I first heard about the master knitter program is I met a woman there who was a master spinner and I remember her telling me that and I was like you got a master's degree in spinning and then she said no no and she went on to tell me all about that program this is also where I first discovered the um, knob bending so we can talk more about the history of knitting later but um, in the course of the history of knitting the transition from um, socks made out of knob bending into socks made out of knitting is something that is believed to be you know the precursor of knitting is this knob bending technique so while i was there i was able to buy a kit with like the history and instructions and that's neither here nor there. That's not what we're talking about this week. We're talking about Norway. So also at this festival, there would of course be vendors selling these beautiful, amazing sweaters. And one of them is what like stands out in my mind as the iconic sweater of Norway. <laughs> and of course, I don't live anywhere near this part of the world. So those of you that do, uh, maybe you'll have a chuckle at me or maybe laugh a little bit as I fail to pronounce things the right way or uh, stumble over my knowledge of things. But the sweater that I am thinking about is this iconic navy blue sweater with red and white patterning across the top. And it is what I now know uh, to be called the Marius Erickson sweater. So Marius Erickson, who is this gentleman? He is a World War II fighter pilot. Um, he is also an Olympic athlete and an actor and a movie star and has become sort of famous for this particular sweater pattern. Now, the, the way that the sweater was linked to him 
uh, you know, my brief sort of internet searching didn't give me a real clear explanation. I heard a little bit of grumbling about maybe the pattern was originally written by his mother, but then picked up by another woman. I don't know. You guys can do the research and delve down that rabbit hole yourself if you really want to. But uh, it did go on to be a sweater associated with him. And in fact, the cover, the picture for the pattern is a picture of him wearing the sweater that was the cover art for a movie that he starred in. So this sweater got well known in the popular media. Obviously it was featured in movies. It was seen on these Olympic athletes. In fact, his brother Stein Erikson was also a very well-known Olympic athlete who, uh, if you look back, you can see tons of videos and pictures of him uh, skiing in this particular sweater. Of course, this sweater, um, you know, it isn't the origins of the, like, it's not like this particular sweater never existed and then mid 1950s, one woman made it and it blew up. Uh, there's a long tradition of sweater knitting and um, actually lots of knitting patterns throughout Norway. And I am not the expert on those, but I would say if you're interested in more uh, Norwegian sweaters and Norwegian knitting patterns, you could go and check out Ellie. Um, she's on the Skandier Knits podcast, and then also Arne and Carlos. They also now have a YouTube podcast, which makes uh, you know lots of interesting information and tidbit about knitting from that part of the world a lot more accessible for me, especially because I... <laughs> find the language in Norway to be very challenging. To me, like the pronunciation is challenging and some parts of the world I can um, like kind of read or watch a video and, and, and suss out and figure out what's being said, but, but not so much with Norwegian knitters. So I'm very thankful for the English language content that's coming out um, from that part of the world. So another thing that I think about when I think about the Norse Coast Fest were the vendors there selling the Norwegian sweaters. And every time I would go, I would think, oh, I'm gonna buy one of these. Finally, I'm gonna buy one of these. I'm gonna buy one of these. But of course, being a knitter, um, my husband would you know, tap me on the shoulder and say, why aren't you just knitting one of these? And I would say, okay, yeah, you're right. And, and not end up buying a sweater. And so as I was researching, about this particular sweater. I, of course, could not resist a browse of the Dale of Norway website, which sells just stunning, beautiful sweaters. And I fell in love immediately with this stunning red and white sweater. Um, they called it like the woman's peace sweater. And I literally had it in my cart ready to purchase it. And I thought, no, you're right. I'm a knitter. I should knit one of these. And so, of course, I went delving down the Ravelry rabbit hole, and oh my gosh, guys, the sweater I found, the exact sweater, is on Ravelry as a free download. I could not believe it. This sweater is so intricate and so stunning, and the idea that it's on Ravelry for free is just um, mind-boggling to me. So, of course, I had to show you right away. Uh, this is the Peace Sweater, and I will put up pictures and a link below. So, if you want to go under Ravelry and get your free version of it to knit it, you should do that right away. Um, of course, this is not the Marius Erikson sweater. So I actually found out that particular pattern is copyrighted, trademarked for production, and like the pattern itself, so not just the sweater, but the stitch pattern is copyrighted and um, licensed for sale for like keychains and things like that. And is considered an iconic pattern for Norway. So I think that's all I'm gonna say about that particular pattern today. Let me show you a little bit about what I've been knitting this week. All right, so what have I been working on? I already told you that this pattern didn't get a lot of love this week. This of course is the Orenburg Worm Shawl from the interweave class that I took on Orenburg Lace Knitting that really launched this entire series. Let's put that bad boy away and show you what's been hogging all my time this week. <laughs> this bad boy here is The Night Book by Natalie V. Oh my gosh, I cannot put this stupid sweater down. As you can tell, I have knit the whole yoke 
I have separated for the sleeves and I am like halfway through the body of this sweater already. Um, this is a stunning all over color work sweater. There is stranded color work from start to finish. You have not a single section of just straight stockinette to be fussed with. And it's funny because I know that uh, when I'm knitting color work, I'm knitting slower than I am with stockinette stitch, but these patterns just seem to fly off the needles. And I think it's, I'm just so interested. Like I wanna keep knitting, I wanna keep knitting. And the patterns are like kind of addicting. Uh, so you finish one row and you just wanna see where the pattern's going next. And next thing you know, I spend all day working on this lovely pattern. So the yarn for this, this beautiful, beautiful dark green is uh, Lemon Jelly Pool, which is an indie dyer out of Tokyo. And this is her soiree colorway. And the beautiful sort of um, lavender pink uh, contrast color is Life in the Long Grass. This is her sport weight and it is on the colorway Prairie. Now both of these yarns, not this particular colorway, the Prairie colorway, but both of these yarns I received as part of the Ami Risu Yarn Club that I signed up for last year. And um, I actually, the Life in the Long Grass yarn that I got was a um, a light blue colorway called Starlit. And I love that one a lot, but it sold out very quickly. And I just wanted to knit more and more and more with this particular yarn. And so here it is. You'll actually in the coming weeks see more about this particular yarn too. So absolutely loving the way this is turning out. I am gonna make this a short sleeve, so I'm not planning on knitting the whole sleeves for these. And that's just because of the climate I live in. It's hot here. <laughs> Uh, something that I'm really loving, so this neckline, something I um, have discovered about myself as a knitter is that I really prefer a tighter neckline, like a crew neck or a round neck, but a, a fairly close one. In fact, this sweater that I'm wearing, uh, this is Arrows Down by Natalie V, which is knit in Brooklyn Tweed Loft. But something that I don't love is the neck, how it's kind of always shifting and a little bit um, wide on me. I think with knitting, um, knitting tends to stretch anyway. And so I prefer a little bit of a closer neck. And this one, I was actually looking very closely at this pattern when I was casting on, trying to decide if I was going to fuss around with the neckline. And thankfully didn't need to. This pattern came uh, written already for a fairly close neck. This is a, um, twisted rib so you're actually supposed to do like a knit through the back loop purl through the back loop rib i only did the knit through the back loop um, mainly because i'm lazy and it takes longer to do purl through the back loop and also because i was actually worried visually it looked like this was going to be a little bit small and i thought that might give me a little bit more neck stretch but I, um, it turned out great just the way i did it so no real modifications here I did my original gauge swatch for this on US size three needles. And it's funny, you can see what a difference blocking makes. This particular pattern looks really nice um, after it's been blocked up. But this gauge was just a little bit too tight of a gauge. So I did go up to a US size four. I think that's a 3.5 millimeter needle. Oh, and I cannot wait for this to be done. I have to make a decision soon about what I want to do for the bottom cuff of this. So if you look at the pattern, um, the pictures look like, it kind of looks like she has the shirt tucked in, but it's actually because the, the bottom waistband cinches in so much that the top kind of flares over. And I don't think that's something I actually want for this pattern. So I am going to kind of stop and, spend some time thinking about what I want to do for this bottom cuff. I'm thinking maybe just like a turned in cuff or um, I've been doing some I-cord cuffs lately. Uh, I'm thinking of the City Limit sweater by Tannis Fiber Arts or Tannis Lavelli, I guess is her name. So I don't know, that's something I'll have to think about and hopefully you guys will get to see progress on in the coming days. So I have been continuing to knit away on these adorable little socks. I mentioned last week that I started working on these. These are just called the mini Christmas tree ornaments on Ravelry. Some of them don't have their ends woven in yet, but they have been just 
such a fun little joy to work on. This is actually my car project right now. So if I um, get to work a few minutes early or get to an appointment a few minutes early because I've had a lot of appointments lately, I will just kind of pick up this pattern and crank away on it. This is a free pattern on Ravelry, but I did make quite a few changes to it. So the pattern is actually designed to be knit completely flat and you knit the, the, the cuff on like both sides, it's like split. So you knit flat with the seam running straight up the back and have to do these weird little turned cuffs on both sides. And that just wasn't, um, my brain wasn't there for that. So I just, uh, knit a sock in the round and so I am more or less following their stitch count but this has gone a long way off from their particular pattern and oh gosh what is the author of this I don't know <laughs> oh my gosh sorry one of my um, cats just like ran face first into our screen door girl girl okay of course, the yarn I'm using for this are little bits of leftovers from, um, oh gosh, my Luminosity sweater, which was another Tannis Fiber Arts pattern that I did a long time ago. And then I'm also using um, little leftovers from some Madeline Tosh um, single mini skeins that I have. Oh gosh, I just realized how much the light has changed since I started recording. So you guys are getting uh, me speckled through the, the sun speckled through the leaves. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna start wrapping things up here. Uh, we did get to spend some time at some restaurants before all the restrictions came back into place. And I'll include some pictures. I stayed, uh, I stayed. I ate at a lovely restaurant called Harvest, which uh, is on the seawall here in Owase and opened just a little bit before the coronavirus lockdown. So I've been waiting very patiently over a year now to try that restaurant out and I was so glad I got to check it out. It was phenomenal. They are up on the second floor above a place called, ooh, what's it called? Garyu, Garyu, Garyu Ramen. <laughs> and uh, next to my favorite coffee shop, which is BB Coffee. And they have just really fresh and amazing and homemade food. Everything I liked, everything I ate there was really phenomenal. So I'm excited to share that. I've been you know, popping on to the Okinawa Foodie Facebook group and the Okinawa Cafes group and sharing that because it was so good and I want them to succeed and do well because then I have a good restaurant in my neighborhood that I can continue to go and eat at whenever we are able to eat at restaurants again. Um, I also seize the opportunity to get a bowl of some of my favorite soba. The um, Okinawa soba here is just phenomenal. It's a pork-based broth. My favorite is called Sanmainiku soba, which is three-layer pork, and it's the cut of meat that bacon is made out of, so a big piece of bacon. Not bacon, but um, Oh gosh, what is it called? Pork belly, pork belly? Yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff and worth trying. If you are ever in Okinawa, there's actually, it's a chain of stores and it's called Gabusoka Soba. Um, you can identify them by the this picture. It's a little animated picture of a guy with some noodles that you see on the front of all the stores and they are really good. Great place to get some authentic, cheap, delicious Japanese soba. Um, yeah, and then of course uh, the COVID cases started to rise again and the restrictions came back into place. So I am back home eating all my home cooked meals. I bought an Instapot and it has been a life changer because I am a terrible cook and I have been able to crank out some really decent food in the last couple of weeks. So with the uh, failing of the light around me, I'm going to call it a day on this episode. As always, I'm so glad you're here with me today. And if you enjoyed this episode, please hit that like, sub like button. <laughs> and if you like this episode, please hit the like button down below. And if you wanna know more about traditional knitting from all over the world, or maybe you wanna check out some of my past episodes, I cover extensively the Master Knitter program and uh, life events here, here in Okinawa. Uh, go ahead and consider hitting the subscribe button. That actually helps me a lot. 
As always, you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Haxton Knits, and I look forward to seeing you all next time.